Uh, better than most, worse than some. <laughs> That's a good one. That's the one my dad uses all the time. Isn't it funny, the older you get, the more you say your dad's stuff. Oh no, I, I've been saying my dad's stuff for 20 years, I just don't do it as often. Okay. Uh, are we recording? We are recording. Okay, so... Please hold on, and it's your turn to remember Jeff. I was thinking about what was I going to remember Jeff? Or how was I going to remember Jeff? And I got four different stories, and I decided I'm going to go with the box of stuff I'm sending up to you. I'm going to include the 41 or 42 pages of, to pause and go rewind to explain what I'm talking about. Uh, back when following service was still following service, and, and it was coming out, but it was only coming out like once or twice a year. And the uh, fan consensus was that, Craig was just taking too damn long, and, you know, why can't he get it on a schedule, yada, yada. I came up with the genius idea of, why don't we just do the Eisner Iger Studio and make an issue of following service and then send it to Craig, and if he likes it, he can publish it. And I've said You this, actually thought of doing that? I said this in the service Yahoo group, and, I, and there was enough people going, that's a good idea, yeah, you should do that. And we started putting something together, and it was going to be the fan issue, where, okay, this is, you know, history of service fandom, uh, like the service, the fan club, and the newsletter and stuff, and it slowly turned into, why don't we do a roundtable of prominent yahoos discussing the series, and we'll, we'll send that to Craig. And I went, well, that's not the idea I had, but it's an idea, so yeah, let's go with this. And it slowly turned into, well, it was your idea, so you're going to be the editor. And I'm like, I never said I would, I said I'd help edit. I never said I'd be the editor. And uh, when Jeff... And they've, already, and they've already changed your idea on you. Well, and, and, and Jeff stayed with me for a week in, like, the middle of winter. It was one of these, he came to visit for a weekend, and it, and it was January, and got... 30 below on the warm days, and he was like, I can't drive home in this, I have to stay. I'm like, alright, so he slept on my couch for a week, and one of the things we did was we printed off these 42 pages of the roundtable discussion from the Yahoos and started to try to edit it, and we got about, oh, I think three lines into it, and Margaret Liss had said probably instead of probably, and we went, oh, this is, this is a bad idea. So these 42 pages have Jeff's hand-corrected notes of, you know, the other problem we ran into, and this ties into something that uh, Chris Werner had said in one of his books that you had sent me a excerpt of, was that the Yahoo group was doing this roundtable and nothing ever happened with it, and he's going to take his section and do something with it. And Well, the reason nothing ever happened was because it was an email chain where people were sending an email and then replying to the email in the email, so like you, you got a block of a paragraph of text, and then later the same paragraph with someone commenting a sentence on it. And and we're going, no one's gonna read this. We don't even want to read this, and we're doing this for free. No one's gonna pay to read this. And and in my email, uh, you'd, you'd have to you'd have to print it on a Mobius strip. I mean that's that some. I I was, it was one of these, it started with, there was like eight of us, and we, we formed a separate service Yahoo group, and it was invite only, and it was, okay, here's the topic, you know, discuss, you know, come up with something, post it, and then people will respond to your postings type thing, and it, like, the first couple of questions I tried to do it, where it was, okay, you know, here's what someone wrote, and I will refer to what they wrote instead of responding in line because it's, it's going to be too confusing otherwise. And after, like, the second or third question, I just started going pass, pass, and finally I said, listen, I'm not taking my turns if I'm editing this. I'm just going to read along, and I will try to come up with something later. And I have all the emails in my email somewhere, and it's one of those, every now and then I think, I should go back and look at that, and this little part of me goes, or you could, you know bang your head against a brick wall, it's the same thing, it just, one doesn't hurt as much. Because <laughs> you 
you've already you've already tried that a couple of times. I, I mean, and I I think Tundis was one of the uh, instigators of the questioning. So it was like you know, it was a broad scale. What do you think of Cerebus the series? And like, okay, you know, here's three paragraphs from Margaret, and then here's two paragraphs from. I think Larry Hart was one of the guys in it, or maybe it was maybe it was Jeff. And then here's Chris responding to Margaret and Jeff at the same time. And then here's somebody else responding to what Chris wrote, responding to, what, and it's like, it, you know, it's this it's this Russian doll that never would end. And the only way we could pr print it was if everybody had their own color, and it was okay, red, then yellow, then green, then back to red. But that was that was. Keep, keep going, keep going. That was my genius idea, though. Was you know, Craig's having trouble getting follow and service done on a timely fashion. Obviously, it's because he doesn't have someone putting the issues together for him, and all he's got to do is go over it and go, "Yeah, okay, that works," and then printing it. I think shortly after that's when issue nine came out, and we were all like, "Okay, this is what you know, Dave doing that for Craig," and it's a good idea, bad idea. Right. You know, like, it, it's a good idea. You got an issue about Neil Adams. It's a bad idea. It's like a triple-sized extravaganza. Right. Which is the other way that this doesn't work. And that's... That's that's my remembrance of Jeff, is that I have these, like I said, 42 pages, or 41 pages, and when I moved into the house, I was cleaning stuff up, and I pulled them out and went... Oh yeah, these. I don't need these, and I threw them in a pile in my room down in the basement. Of okay, this is stuff I can recycle eventually, and they've sat there every day since then till today. When I went, oh hey, they're still here, and I picked them up. I'm like, these are getting cleaned up and sent up to Dave, and he can put them in a file folder and forget they exist until Eddie takes over and goes, what the hell is this? <laughs> and then, and then Eddie can revive following service. And uh, it'll be a completely effortless process. Um, That's the thing. Every, everybody always thinks that uh, you know. Uh, why can't Why can't this guy just get it together and uh, uh, you know get get his fanzine done? And it's like, uh, well, if you if you've never actually tried to do it on your own, it, even uh, as as you say in this case, we're trying to do. Uh, What's, what's the easiest way to do a, a following service? And it's like, we'll just have a bunch of Cerebus fans um, talking talking about Cerebus, and uh, it, the, the magazine will put itself together. <laughs> it's like, no magazine ever puts itself together. And the more you try to try to simplify it, the, 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 less, the less properly it's going to work. Well, somebody emailed me and asked uh, if, because I, was, somebody had sent the digital copies of Glamour Plus Two, and they asked, Do you, "Is there digital copies of Following Service?" And I'm like, "Technically, yes," because I was scanning them in. And right. then today, David Birdsong sent me <laughs> a, a PDF. It's it's PDFs of issues one through eight and ten through twelve. Like, e even the guys that were scanning this and doing not good job scanning it went looked at issue 9 and went, no, we're, we're not going to do that one. <laughs> Wait a minute, that was a great issue. I'm not saying it's not a great issue, but it's a really hard issue to scan into a computer without doing what Margaret did, which is ripping off the binding and breaking the right. spine so you can scan page by page. And even she gave up and sent me her copy when I told her I was starting to scan my copies. Uh, yeah, there's just something that, that that's, uh, that's fan versus collector. And the collector is going, this, I, I, I can't bring myself to do this. And the fan's going, well, you pretty much have to. And that's, that's when the whole thing breaks down as well. So, uh, so, uh, moving to Jeff Seiler Part Two, which is actually Steve Swenson's Part Part One. Hello, Steve. Um, can you read the the notes on this uh, Jeff Seiler, the Cerebus Guide to Self Publishing, the ones around the outside? So I only sent you the main photo, but he actually sent me like nine photos where he went and took pictures all the way around to get it better and easier to read. And I looked at them and. 
I can translate most of it into English. So is it okay? So I actually right. when I, when I got home, I sat at the computer, looked at the photos, and opened up a Word document and typed up what I'm pretty sure it says, and then I printed it out so that I can read it right now. So it because I'm going to put the image the whole thing up in the videos for this. It's best wishes to Jeff Seiler and then in parentheses on the occasion of coming to Canada to get his stuff back and parentheses and then I believe in Jeff's handwriting it's in parentheses good stuff asterisk back and then in parentheses 7-8 slash 9-11 your signature is Dave Sim 76-2011 and then down in the lower right hand corner there's an arrow kind of pointing towards the signature and, and written across this little arrow is mostly that guy or er um hmm dude really nice hair and then in parentheses JAS which is Jeff Allen Seiler and then all of these are parenthetical by themselves is but he will die unloved unmourned and alone and that was going up the right hand side of the image and then okay. on the top of the image written upside down so you have to turn the book over to read it is good thing his creator didn't exclamation point also it's a good thing that most people and this is where I started having trouble because it was it's not a great photo it's it's a good thing that most people the or else it's he will read or need this and I th or this could be his will realize that I ran out of space even though I have a and then I'm not sure what it says and then it says for margins someday when you possibly buy this book and you all laugh by JAS so I, I sent an email to Steve saying hey if you get a chance could you take better pictures of those two sections that are hard to or if, if you can translate it into English what did Jeff write but it, it, it's definitely Jeff's handwriting. It is. Okay. I, I was going to say, you know what his handwriting looks like. You've got 41 pages of correction. Um, <laughs> I mean... It, okay. So and, that, that's, it's a very weird thing for Jeff to do. That's... What I'm thinking is that... Because Steve says that it... In, in his question, Steve says that it looks like it's two different pens for the image of service, and I'm thinking maybe Jeff went back and added more hair to it, unless you did. Uh, well, from what I can see on my copy, the thing that I was thinking was, it's odd because uh, it looks like I'm doing um, a Japanese brush pen, brush strokes, and then uh, inking over top of them, which is, you know, not a bad way to do a, uh, a fur texture, but I can't picture myself doing that with, uh, the Cerebus Guide to Self-Publishing because the paper is, it's just paper. It's not, not particularly thick, not particularly thin, but not particularly thick. And there's no way that you could do something with a Japanese brush pen without having it soak all the way through to the other side. So that would be one of my questions for you, Steve, is does it look as if um, the ink so soaks through to the other side? Um, I, I, think, I think we've probably gone as far as we can with uh, uh, the rudimentary pictures that, that we're both referring to right now. So I think we'll... We'll defer this one to next time when I can look at a uh, better uh, photograph of it that uh, you can get Alfonso to print out. And uh, I'm not. It, it might tell me more. It might just uh, raise some some different questions. Um, the other thought I would have is because Jeff came up and you guys went down to Toronto for that podcast interview you did with, I forget her name. So right, maybe, yeah, I forget her name too. Maybe uh, when you guys were hanging out, you know, 
you know, you know, sitting around talking, maybe you grabbed a pen and just, you know, kept putting hair on, making the fur bigger, because, you know, it was good, like, waiting for food type thing. Uh, that's possible. I, my, my impression uh, is that this was one of the things that Jeff was wondering about when he got here, was do you have copies of the Cerebus Guide to Self-Publishing? And it's like, uh, yeah, not, not a lot of them, but uh, I got some of them. Um, you know, I'll just I'll just give you one. Don't don't worry about it. And then um, started started working on it. Um, I mean, the Jeff Styler lettering is uh, pretty fully developed. It's uh, from the time period when I was. Um, starting on uh, Strange Death of Alex Raymond, and I was doing the modified kind of uh, um, Warren Magazine title lettering that they did, which I always liked. I think uh, either either Bill Dubay came up with that or a letterer under Bill Dubay's instructions came up with the lettering style, but I always liked it. It's very, very versatile. It works with... Uh, um, a lot of different uh, styles and looks really good, particularly with uh, uh, a photorealistic style. So that's why I decided to uh, to adapt that. I don't ordinarily do that on something that I'm personalizing to somebody. So whenever I was doing it, um, if we were just sitting out back on the porch, possibly, and uh, yeah, I'll just doodle away at this while we sit here and talk um, before we actually, you know, do the, the, the Kitchener tour of, of Dave Sim locations and then go from there to Toronto. Um, it is odd that it would be, from what Steve's saying, it's obviously uh, two different kinds of pens. Um, and that that doesn't sound like me. It's possible that it's uh, um, a ballpoint, and then um, I would occasionally use the ballpoint really lightly, just to just to get the contours and where everything's going to go, and then uh, grab a. Um, uh, Name slips my mind. The uh, archival pen uh, grabbed like a, a, a zero one uh, or a zero zero five or both of them uh, archival pen, and then start inking over the uh, the ballpoint. So it's it's a more finished drawing, and um, every, everything's at least theoretically where it's supposed to be. Uh, that I wouldn't be able to tell until. Uh, until I saw a, uh, a better reproduction. Um, if Steve could go to a, uh, a print shop, just Kinko's or something like that, and if you could uh, get them to scan it at um, uh, 700 uh, DVI RGB and then just um, send that scan to Alfonso, that would be probably the closest that we could get to what this actually looks like without actually sending it to me so that, uh, so that I could see it. Uh, it, it, is, it is strange. I can't think of too many people who, having gotten something this finished, would then um, sit down and uh, you know, write their own notes uh, around the outside of it. Uh, unless uh, Jeff had, uh, had had a few by, by that point, which, uh, you know, it's very possible he was here first, uh, and then we went to Toronto, and then from Toronto he went up to uh, the Lakehead to um, the crazy Canadian lady's place to get his stuff. And depending on how that went, <laughs> which was probably, uh, from what I could gather, was no day at the beach. Uh, Jeff was still pretty shook about uh, the whole 
relationship and the ending on the whole relationship. It's very possible that uh, having having had a few uh, fermented beverages, uh, it suddenly seemed like a really good idea for him to uh, uh, write his write his own notes on it, and uh, <laughs> the notes just degenerated by the time he got around to the, uh, the left side of the title page. And I'd be in, I'd be curious if Steve wouldn't mind uh, uh, telling all of us uh, how much he paid for it. Well, I kind of want to know, not not so much how much you paid for it, but where was the seller located? <laughs> you know, did this get shipped right. out of Minneapolis? Did it get shipped from his sister's place? Did it get shipped from Alabama or Arkansas, wherever his brother lives? I mean, like like I said in in, in my facts, I, I it, I'm not bitter. I mean, it, that technically should be mine, but you know, I, I'm I'm not gonna fight about it. Of you got to send me this book you bought. I mean, you know. You, you, you paid cash money, it's yours. Right, right. I mean, uh, uh, Jeff also had uh, a break-in in his uh, in his storage unit. Uh, but I think he had two, two storage um, cages at the apartment building um, in about six months, eight months before he died. And was trying to figure out how many things um, actually got stolen and how many he just can't find because uh, he had a lot of things. So that's another one of those. Um, you don't you don't know. It, it ended up somewhere um, with someone, and uh, then it ended up on eBay at some point. But uh, it's it's very difficult to get into any kind of uh, finger pointing on that, um, which is which is one of those um, the the people who are going okay. We all have to learn a lesson from this. Uh, do uh, you know make make out your will uh, and and get it done you know ahead of time. Uh, yeah, there's that element to it. There's also uh, at least start making a list of everything, starting from. These are probably the most valuable things that I own, and uh, at least get that to the lawyer that you plan to have making up your will for you to say, um, okay, here's photocopies or photographs or scans of everything that's in my, these would probably go for a good buck on eBay, so I want to specify uh, these are going to these people, and then uh, publicize it, which is one of those, uh, you know, you'd probably have to, they'd have to send it to you so that you have it on a moment of Cerebus, and you can say, okay, here's uh, here's all the stuff in, in, in this person's estate that uh, is signed by Dave or has drawings by Dave on it or is a piece of Dave's artwork. And here's who I would like to have end up with these. And then, uh, okay, at least there's uh, there's a paper trail on that. And Jeff Jeff got a start on that, but uh, you can't work through the whole process of okay, I have to um, get everything I own I own identified, and then specify who is it, who it's going to. Um, that's just going to telescope up ahead of you. Um, and you're talking about a, a years-long process. <laughs> Most of the service fan base are not going to live that long <laughs> if, if that's what you're trying to do. So uh, I, um, I, I, I always advocate that if you don't have some specific fan in mind, just send it back to the archive, you know. You know, just, you know, leave notes of, okay, send it back to Aardvark Vanaheim, and the problem I have with that is, on the one hand, in general, yes, yeah, send everything back. But then you go to, like, how many copies of all 16 phone books is the archive possibly going to need? Right, right. Um, like, but there's, uh, uh, that's one of those where it would be, okay, does it have a sketch on it? Um, how good a sketch is it? Uh, who is it a sketch of? Because, uh, you know, those, day, those days are gone where I would just sort of, as I did with Jeff, just arbitrarily 
oh, okay, if I'm giving you this, I'll, uh, you know, I might as well put a therapist head sketch on it for you as well. It's, um, you know, I, I, this, this is my first experiment with, uh, with doing ballpoint pen sketches and, uh, and fully inked sketches on, uh, the current Kickstarter. And right now we're sitting at, I think, uh, Three full size Cerebuses, three um, Cerebus arm and medallions drawing, and seven ballpoint pen. So I've I've asked I've asked Birdsong to to keep me posted on that. Don't, don't suddenly tell me okay now we're up to fifty on each of them because uh, then I might have to make another plan. But uh, it's it's going to be it's going to be a pretty finite resource. So that would be something. I would be interested in if that's what people would want to send back to the archive. Dave Sim did this um, sketch of Cerebus as Groucho Marx or uh, Matisse the Unknown Turtle or any of the, my other uh, greatest hit sketches. And, uh, you know, here's, here's the date that he did it. And I sent it back to the archive because it's, it's one of those, well, okay, there's, finite number of them and uh, there ain't, there ain't going to be no more or there will be very very few well I know that uh, Jeff sent me photos that I'll be running while we're talking because I have them of he had a number of the phone book, later phone books that he took when Gerhard was in Minneapolis at a, at a show and he had Gerhard do sketches of you know service environments on the title pages and I'm, there's a part of me going, well, you know, if Jeff's collection did get broken up and has got, you know, has is now loose in the wind, that means that there's these four or five phone books with whatever it was Gerhard put in them, and you know, stuff like that. It'd be, well, yeah, it'd be nice to get that back to the archive. The other one I'm thinking of is Nate Oberstein, who you know has almost in a complete set of the phone books, like. His set, I could definitely see if he left it back to the archive, it'd be, okay, the whole set just stays together because they're all the phone books. All of the printings, not just all of the phone books. Yeah. That's, he, he just sent me photos of them. Because of, I, I always ask him, okay, so what are you looking for? And he'll send me his spreadsheet, and I'm like, it, 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 my brain doesn't work that way. I can't read spreadsheets very well. It, if, right. if you give me a list of, I need these five phone books, I can tell people, okay, he needs... This printing to this book, this printing to this book, whatever. But if you give me a spreadsheet, and then I got to figure out what it means. And by the time I figure it out, I, I just don't have the motivation to tell everybody. And <laughs> that's that's you're tapped out for energy at that point. Well, and the part I love about Nate's collection is, I mean, he just sends the the spines on a, on a bookcase. But like the second or third printing of guys, Eddie Campbell's not on the spine. For some Wait, reason, what? for some reason, the the art has been shifted. So it's it says guys, and it has the number, and you can see a strip of the bar. But where Eddie would be has been moved. Oh, okay, all right, yeah. Somebody, uh, somebody doing a shortcut, going. We're just going to slap the spine on this, and not not really worry about what's supposed to be under there. And. I mean, like, that's, uh, the other one that I loved was Volume 1, you know, the, the first three or four printings are the spineless where there's, n there's no author title or the volume number, and then when that stuff starts getting put on, you could, you know, if you, if you look at Nate's photos, because there's, t like, 12 of them, you can see the evolution of, okay, we're going to move it up, we're going to change the font a little... I think the first one it says Dave Sim service, and then the next printing it's just service. Uh, right. The number didn't show up to like volume five or printing five, I think. And, I remember that. Yes, yes, it's all coming back to me now. Well, it's not all coming back to me, but some of it is. <laughs> the the stuff that you repressed because you didn't need to remember it. It's all it's all coming back. What year yes. is it? Am I am I am I still an atheist? Am I dating somebody? Am I late for a date? Right, right. You know, I, yes, I, I would. I would agree with you that uh, um, while Nate is still with us, if he hasn't gotten his will together, uh, definitely as many photos as he can put together and uh, and chart these 
these variations um, because it's definitely not something that I kept track of. It was always, you know, well, okay, we have to fix this on the new printing and, you know, make a note of it. Uh, but once that got fixed or at least changed, um, you know, fixed in quotation marks, and then next time you go, well, no, now, now we got to do this thing here. Um, and having to do it with, uh, you know, well, at, at the start, two or three of them, Church and State One, High Society, and, and Cerebus, not necessarily in that order. And then, uh, okay, now we're up to volume 10. Um, it, was, it was never a happy day around here. Okay, now we have to look at the last printing and go, do we want to change anything this time? Because uh, it's going to be you know, another six months or a year until uh, we get another chance to, to get this right. That's, I mean, the other one that threw me for a loop is I knew that the first, I think, five volumes had spineless printings where there was no no uh, information on the spine. I didn't realize it went up to Melmoth. I didn't know that the first couple printings of Melmoth didn't have anything on the spines. And I'm like, you know, this is what he's, every time I look at Nate's photos, I go, oh, there's some I didn't see. Oh, there's some. It's like, you know, that's one of the reasons why. I really like it when Nate go, sends me a message of, okay, here, you know, I, I organize stuff, here's better photos. It's like, oh, wow, I can just stare at my phone for the next two, three hours going, huh, I wonder why they did, I wonder why they, I wonder, you know, it's one of those, I could, you know, I could write it all down and we could do a please hold where it's nothing but, okay, so the third printing of volume seven, why did you guys, and you'll be, I, I don't know. I don't know, Matt. I don't know. I don't know. To the best of my recollection, as they used to say in uh, in the Watergate days. Well, I think that definitely calls for a, a you go, Nate. Um, thank you, thank you for being the guy who was that obsessive about all of the printing, so that uh, that information hasn't gotten entirely lost, either entirely lost yet or entirely lost. Period. Exactly. Uh, it's uh, okay. Yeah. Then we got into the uh, expanded lines on the sketch, um, and Steve gave me a copy of Six Deadly Sins portfolio for my birthday. Wasn't that nice of him? Well, it was one of these, it showed up and like, I looked at the calendar and went, well, I'm just not going to let anybody know I got this for a couple of days because then it's my birthday. <laughs> so I just sent it to you, just like that. Yeah, that was, it was, do you have a copy of this? No. Oh, well, I'll send you one. I'm like, well, this works out. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with this. Uh, for my birthday, when I posted it, Damien said about the envy plate, uh, that road in the second one is weirdly twisty. And David, Dave Coverman replied, the twisty road is definitely on the original. And it's so specific that I feel like the effect was deliberate. I was originally going to say that the perspective might have gotten away from Dave, but the pattern floor on that final piece is pretty flawless. Uh, I'm going to come down on Damien's side on this one. Um, it's not, I wouldn't describe it as weirdly twisty, but I would describe it as strangely tilted. And that was a result of not knowing what I was doing and not knowing how complicated what I was trying to do was so that um, from my vantage point here, 41 years later, uh, if I was sitting down with Dave Sim of 1981 and he was describing, well, I want to do cobblestone. I want to do cobblestones that actually look like cobblestone. I would know what he meant. Uh, but it would be, okay, you mean uh, fitted stones, uh, interlocking stones, but uh, at, at, an, at an angle, which, which is usually how
how they are if you actually have a cobblestone road, which is what I was trying to do. And it's like, okay, the, the problem you're going to run into is uh, you're going to have the perspective for the one, the, the two different sides of the cobblestone. And then you're going to have another perspective on the top and bottom of the cobblestone. It's two separate vanishing points. And the biggest problem you're going to have is with the horizontal one. Um, at the horizontal line that you're, you can pick a vanishing point and say, okay, it's way the hell and gone over here on the right. And then uh, get a ruler and start um, laying in the, uh, the parallel lines that will make up the top and bottom of the cobblestone. But the question you're going to have is um, how quickly are, are the cobblestones receding into the background? And that's going to be implied by the rest of the background. And you're going to need practically um, a slide rule to figure out, okay, what rate are the cobblestones receding into the background and consequently how far apart do the top and bottom lines need to be right here at the front of the illustration or as uh, physically describing at the bottom of the illustration, uh, an inch up from there, two inches up from there. Um, it, 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 what, what I was uh, misconstruing was, okay, as long as I'm taking a long time to do it, this isn't a page that I have to get done for the next issue. So consequently, I can take pretty much as much time as I need for this, or, you know, I'm going to have, I forget how much time I allocated, uh, probably a couple of days, three days per piece. Um, I, I, by, by not solving the problem ahead of time or by not understanding what the problem was, uh, it, it was all I can do is add as much tiny little line detail as I can to them and try through the little line detail to create the effect, the effect that, uh, I'm picturing in my head. And it's like, uh, that's, that's not going to work because um, the eye registers the perspective on the lines um, identifying and establishing where the cobblestones are uh, and only, you know, after that and substantially after that goes, wow, look at all those tiny little lines which is why uh, Damien's saying uh, it's weirdly twisty. Um, yes, it's uh, weirdly twisty is one way of saying it. Uh, weirdly tilted is a different way of saying it. Uh, just looking at it, um, okay, what's, what's your impression of this? It looks as if the cobblestones are sloping down from right to left so that uh, Cerebus is running on a uh, much higher plane than uh, the guy carrying the large statue. Uh, and it's like, well, you know, once, once you've gotten this far, if you want to, if you want to proceed with um, doing authentic cobblestones and drawing each individual cobblestone, and rendering each individual cobblestone, uh, it's going to take you a long time to do, and it's still going to look as wrong when you're done doing the road, if not wronger, <laughs> that uh, when when you when you get the piece actually finished. Um, uh, I'm trying I'm trying to fix it as I go along, uh, 
where I go, well, if I put, uh, if I put the shadows in, um, shadow on the figure, which was, was not something I was going to do, um, the, the shadow coming from service, the shadow uh, coming from the guy running, uh, that didn't help matters. Um, it, it did, it did to a small degree, but, um, the parallel lines are uh, completely overwhelming any kind of effect that I could add to it. And I'm just killing my own uh, lighting effects. Services shadow is going off to the right, but I've got a very large brush stroke on the front of his snout because the snout is blending into um, the cobblestones. And when I put the 30% tone on, that's, that's not going to help. It's, it would be a matter of sitting down and saying, okay, here's all the problems that you're going to face trying to do actual cobblestone. And the odds are you're, you're, it's not going to be any better when you're done than when you started. Uh, so why don't you create a different effect? Just lose the cobblestone, but uh, create a different texture in your mind that... Um, you can put in all of the time that you're going to put in on the cobblestones, but do something else. Um, do a, uh, a a pebbled background uh, where it's uh, um, irregular stones uh, interconnecting, which contrast with the uh, the fitted stones that make up the, the two sidewalks on on either side, and uh, put your time in on that. Um, it's particularly glaring because the, uh, the plate one, uh, I accidentally did the same thing, um, with the, uh, um, the slot where, uh, it's service on the, on the slave ship. And it's like, well, okay, there, there you did, uh, what you should have done on this one, which is if I'm going to put in this kind of time. I need to design a background where um, you get full value for all of the all the pen lines uh, going in there. Uh, plate six. Uh, I, I tried to solve the problem there in uh, in Pride, but uh, and, and this would have worked with uh, with the NV plate as well, which is. Um, if I, if I use a larger pattern, do basically the same thing, um, two-point uh, two perspective, and uh, basically just make the fitted stones a, a larger pattern, not, not a smaller pattern or a more intricate pattern. And it's like uh, the pride plate isn't perfect either, but it's a lot closer to it than uh, than the envy plate. So that's one of those live and learn. Until until I did um, the envy plate, I had never really done any uh, uh, picture where I was banking on putting in that much time on the detail and going the detail alone will make it worth the time that I'm putting in on. <laughs> it's like, well, it's a theory, but no, you're going to find out uh, the more time you put in on it, um, it's still going to uh, completely suck. And uh, depending on the person looking at it 40 years later, it's going to be uh, weirdly twisty or uh, weirdly slanted. Well, but you did learn a valuable lesson from this because when you got to high society and you were in the lower city and you were, there were cobblestone streets, you set the perspective much different and, and, you know, put a lot of people and stuff around. Right. Yes. I mean, you do, you do learn as you're going along, which is why um, my brain turned to cream cheese working on... Um, the commentaries for service number four, because it's like, oh man, it's uh, <laughs> it's tough enough uh, having to learn uh, in public 
uh, okay, you don't want to do this anymore. Uh, you do want to do this, and this is close, but uh, you, you still haven't got it right. And having to live through that again, and then describe, here's what I was trying to do, here's what ended, I ended up doing, here's what I ended up learning from this. Um, it's one of those, uh, not one of my favorite things in the world to do, but I also understand that for the sake of posterity, um, issue four is a very, very popular Sarah's issue. So, uh, write everything that I can possibly write about it while I'm here this one time saying, okay, here, when I look at service number four, uh, this is what I see now. And uh, email all of the, uh, Scott Rowley to email all of the commentaries to you and all of the commentaries to David Birdsong. And uh, I told him to take as much space as you need with it. This is commentaries on 22 pages instead of 10 pages. So, uh, uh, I, we, we can't, we can't be using, uh, the service archive portfolios to date as, as the pattern on this. And, uh, um, you, you just let me know what, uh, how, mu how much room it needs to breathe. So it sounds like it's going to be six pages of commentary. Um, uh, as far as, as far as I know, he's got it all pasted up now. So we're, we're just about ready to, uh, to go ahead with that one. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not a real good experience looking back at um, your own semi-professional work when uh, you know, you've been a professional cartoonist for as long as I have. And we're, we're sticking with Steve. Steve got a random copy of an issue of Cerebus that his daughter bought him while they were on vacation and she found it in a resale shop. Um, that's pretty impressive. I had no idea that uh, the daughters were getting in on this. The, uh, oh, dad will want this. Um, I asked which issue, and Steve responded, it's 106, which got me to thinking, what would have happened if the, I uh, can't think of that three-headed monstrosity's name. The three-headed monstrosity's name is Fred Ethel and the Little Fellow with the Hair, uh, which is a very long-winded name, but that's as close as I came to an actual name for he, she, it. Um, had reached the moon in addition to slash rather than Cerebus. Uh, did the, quote, real God, unquote, cause the tower to crack just where Cerebus was so Cerebus alone could continue the moonward journey? Uh, that gets a little complicated. Even at the time, as an atheist, I understood, uh, or thought I understood, it was my understanding of the nature of reality that expressions like, um, the bigger they are, the harder they fall, actually had um, physical properties to them where, yes, it's, it's a, uh, it's a fact of existence and a fact of, uh, creation, certainly as, you know, I'm now somebody who does believe that, uh, it is a creation. It's not just a, uh, manifestation or a random series of events that uh, the bigger they are, the harder they fall, does apply, and that the tower that I was uh, creating uh, as, as a metaphysical concept, uh, you realize, okay, it starts as the circumference of the upper city of the S, and then as it's rising, um, it's, uh, the circumference is getting smaller, uh, and then that starts accelerating. And, um, yes, I, I considered it a, 
a a baked in property of the ascensions uh, when it is uh, the, the the tower um, getting taller and taller and taller and then breaking off and then you know basically taking off same as a, as a rocket ship does um, that. This was the way of prevent, preventing uh, oversized entities from uh, completing the journey. You can you can get up just this so this high on it, and then as the circumference is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, that entity isn't going to uh, be able to maintain its. Uh, its stability, and yes, the the tower will crack, and at whatever point the tower cracks, uh, an appropriate sized entity, if another entity went along for the ride, will uh, uh, will be able to, con- to continue on. But it is a this high and no higher, as opposed to. Um, the bigger they are, um, entities who uh, assume that uh, the the bigger you are, the higher you can get. So consequently, bigger is better. And it's like mm, bigger is not necessarily uh, part of that dynamic. It's uh, survival of the fittest, not. Uh, Necessarily, the survivor of the strongest, but the survival of the most appropriate, the uh, the, the best fitted for uh, for for the context. Um, so yes, that was that was one of those. Don't know how to describe this, so I'm really glad that uh, I only have to draw it and. Uh, you know, with uh, um, obviously with uh, with Gerhardt's assistance, but you know, explaining to him, okay, this is the concept behind it. So this is what you're going to be drawing. Um, at this point, it's uh, you know, the tower is just tall enough and has extended just far enough that you know they're able to uh, walk on either side of it and. Um, Fred Ethel and the little fellow with the hair can actually jump from one side to the other. Uh, but that's only going to exist for, for a length of time. And then uh, basically describing that as, as we went along, or probably actually did you know, uh, rough little sketches of, okay, at this point, this is the size that the tower is getting, and this is the size of the... Uh, the demon heads and skulls that are making it up. Does it sound like I answered the question? Well, it's a lot more thorough than my answer. My answer is the title of the comic isn't Fred Ethel and the Little Fellow with the Hair. <laughs> so you know if there's two characters and one of them's on the t- his, his name is the title of the book, he's probably going to make it. <laughs> right, right. I mean that is one of those things. Wouldn't wouldn't that be a nice thing to find out that you're in a comic book called Matt Dow, that you're not living in a comic book called Paula Dow, or living in a comic book whatever your boss's name is. Years ago, like twenty years ago, because I'm forty three now. So yeah, actually twenty three years ago, my uh, uh, the group I hung out with, we were going to the. Wizard World Chicago, or formerly the Chicago Comic Con, every year, and like the second or third year, uh, my friend who was an aspiring writer came up with a joke that uh, that the Matthew Dow show has been uh, renewed for another season, and like wrote a fake news article about the show and and included all of us and sent it out. And somebody respond because there was like six of us on this email thread. Somebody responded with their version of it, and I was, I'm like, I'm not, I mean, because yes, I get it. You're pretending that we're all on a TV show, but you're on a TV show, and you're saying it's my TV show, which 
okay, but if I'm the main character and you guys are all the side characters, why are you writing these fake articles? So I wrote one that said that my body was found dead and, uh, and my friend took it way to the extreme. He had flowers delivered to the house to my mom and my brother who was living there. Uh, no one called me for two weeks. Uh, everybody was ignoring me. And, and, it's, and then that's when I started every couple days sending out a list of Matt Dow sightings because cause obviously it, it, you know, it's a fake death like Elvis thing. And after about two weeks, we, you know, okay, we finally, you know, you know, ended the game. But yeah, no, it was, it was, you know, your life's a TV show. And I'm like, really? Because I don't really do anything. Who wants to watch this all day? It's, uh, it, it's, it's more serious than the Elvis situation. There was never an Elvis show. I mean, you know, he had to go to stadiums and stuff like that to be Elvis. It sounded like you just had to be Matt Dow. Um, and there you go. They, they, they picked you up for another season. Somebody's got to be watching. I mean, they're not, they're not just making these numbers up. Well, and shortly after that, the, the group of us had kind of broken up and, you know, we weren't all hanging out together and I was hanging out with other guys and I realized that if my life were a TV show, it got canceled and now I'm in somebody else's show as a side character that spun out of my show. And it's one of those, you know, it's, it'd be like uh, if Kramer got his own show or Kramer had his own show and then like Seinfeld came along and it's, oh, okay, now, you know, Kramer's a side character on this other show. And... It was weird because it was one of those, you know, I'm like, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be the star of this thing, and all I do is sit back and watch everybody else. What, what's going on now? It's, uh, Fraser's probably the better example. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, where it's, uh, okay, you used to be on Cheers, and you were just one of the guys on Cheers, but now you're on Fraser, and Fraser is about you. And, uh, yeah, I, uh, we have no idea that that really might be the case. I mean, it's uh, um, assuming that there are omniscient and near omniscient and quasi omniscient beings, which I sort of take as a given. We have no idea what they think is the most interesting thing to watch. Um, what's what, what's the, the the ratings blockbuster? It could be. Uh, you know, uh, Taylor Swift, oh, we got Taylor Swift out the wazoo. We know exactly what they're like. They're not interesting. But but the Matt Dow show, man, it's just year after year, it's just a, a ratings blockbuster. Especially the Christmas episode where he watches the three-hour fake Yule log. Now, okay, on, on that note. <laughs> now we're, 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 we're moving on. 